We are in our Bible study on the book of Romans. We uh, have gotten almost where I think this week we should be able to finish the second chapter. So next week we should be able to move on to the third chapter, I believe. And uh, let me just get this set here. Last week we have gotten through verse 20. And this week we will begin at verse 21. Paul writes, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man shall not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge ye, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. This is really interesting. If you remember last week, we were talking about, uh, Paul was addressing the Jews among the Romans. And he began to talk and he was trying to help the Romans kind of understand uh, as a Jew, you know, the law is the greatest possession we have. It's a gift from God that has been given to us and we hold it up and it, it's so important to us and it's just so wonderful and therefore just being the conduit through which the law was given to humanity, uh, we feel like a special people. We feel like a unique people. We feel like the teacher. We feel like the inspirer. You know, God's given us the information. And we're the conduit through which this information has been given to humanity. And now Paul's continuing his thoughts. You've got you to keep last week in mind as we move into this week. Because this is where too many people read Scripture, study Scripture, preach Scripture, and they literally act like a verse just stands all by itself and says something. It does not. And when you try to preach or teach the Word of God in that fashion, you do it a great injustice. And chances are 98% of the time, you're deriving a message that is not there. Mm -hmm. You're making Scripture say something it's really not trying to say. You've got to keep things in context. You've got to keep things in proper context. So Paul first starts talking about how uh, precious the law is to the Jewish people and how special, in effect, it makes the Jewish people feel and how it makes us feel like, we're the bearers of light. And how it makes us feel like we're the teachers of babes. And we're, you know, we're all the... Now he goes in and he said, Thou therefore which teachest another. Yeah. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. Right. That are among the Romans. He said, yeah, you've got the law. And because you have the law, you feel like, well, bless God, God's given us the law. That's put us in a place to teach these poor little uh, ungodly Romans, you've got to remember how, I've said this many times through the course of this study, I'll probably say it many times more, you've got to remember how the Jewish people looked at Gentiles, yeah. and particularly the Romans. 
they had a very, very, very low opinion of these people. I mean, these people were dogs. Yeah. They were the filth of the earth. They had conquered Palestine. They had conquered most of the known world, for that matter. And uh, these were just some of the, the ugliest, nastiest people that, so far as the Jews were concerned, they'd ever laid eyes on. They were idolaters. They were uh, immoral there were so many things that the Romans were famous for that was just abhorrent to the Jewish people. And on top of all this, it's these filthy dogs who are running our country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had a very negative opinion. When you understand that fact alone and you read chapter 1, mm -hmm. it helps you to understand a little better why Paul is saying what Paul is saying. When he talks about these people and how they degraded morally and they degraded spiritually to the point that they are so committed to idolatry and yet at the same time they don't really even believe in God. See, that's the dichotomy that Paul's talking about in chapter 1. Because he says they did not want to retain God in their knowledge and yet at the same time they're idolatrous. You see, a lot of people don't understand. You can go to church and not believe in anything. That's, That's right. right. Hello now. That's you can right. go through the motions right. and not really believe in anything. That's what Paul's talking about in chapter 1 of Romans. Yeah. And he's saying their conduct bears witness to the fact that they don't believe in anything. They really don't believe there's a God at any level. Even all their myriad of gods, they don't really believe there's a God. They elevate a man as though he were God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, they really don't necessarily believe in their heart of hearts that there's a God in heaven, anywhere, Jupiter, Zeus, or anybody else that they're going to answer to and give account of themselves. So they're living their lives as though God is really not even a, a reality. And yet, religion is very much a part of their lives. Yeah, mm -hmm. just like today, yeah. Yeah, and the Word of God says that God gave them over, because they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Right. Yeah. That reprobate mind was specifically imparted to them, listen carefully, yeah. because why? They did not retain God in their knowledge. Yeah. So GLBT believer, do not think for one minute that when it describes what appears to be LGBT people, you know, wholesale, that it is in fact describing LGBT people in wholesale fashion. No, it is describing people who have no desire whatsoever to even think of God or give God a place in their thinking. If you're in this room tonight, LGBT people, or otherwise, you do not fit that description. Amen. And I, can, I can't right. say that right. enough. Alright? So Paul is saying now to the Jewish people, he said, okay, y'all are so proud of the fact you're teachers because God gave us the law. He said, therefore, uh, thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thyself, thou that preachest a man should not steal, Dost thou steal, thou that sayest the man shall not commit adultery? Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Now, Paul is writing to the Jews in Rome. There's a major problem when you immerse yourself in a society that behaves contradictory to the way you believe. What happens in most instances? You begin to emulate that society. So Paul is saying to these Jews, here you are in Rome, but rather than being this teacher and being this shining light that you claim to be, because after all, God gave us the law, you're emulating them. You're acting like them. Say, what are you doing? You're saying don't murder and you're murdering. You're saying don't steal, and you're stealing. You're saying 
that we are not to worship idols, and here you are committing abomination related to idolatry yourself. Are you following? Yes, amen. So he's saying you're assimilating. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're actually becoming more like them rather than leading them out. You're getting more and more immersed in their way of life. You're becoming more and more like them. See, isn't it interesting when you keep things within a proper context? Yep. So he said, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. Who's he talking to? The Jews. The Romans do not make their boast of the law. That's right. So Paul is specifically... I'm telling you, you, do you see what I mean about how we've got to be really careful about taking something and just pulling it out of context? Now, in the process of this conversation, is Paul making a commentary in general, you might say, about live what you preach and preach what you live? Yes. He's saying, obviously, that if you're going to boast of the law, then you ought to be living according to the law. But see, part of the problem here is there were Jews that were part of the church, the part of the New Testament church. We still have this law conflict. Yeah, yeah that's right, to this day. You've got to remember, we, people read what Paul wrote as though he wrote it in the year 2000. Right, I know. And circumstances were what they are today. He did not, it was not, they are not. Amen. He wrote this within decades of the Lord's walking planet Earth. Yes. The Christian church barely had a foundation. Mm -hmm. right. He's not writing to a church that's been there for a hundred years or 200 years, yes. or 500 right. years, yes. and they had hundreds of years worth of teaching, hundreds of years worth of tradition, hundreds of years worth of uh, establishment. No, he's writing to people who have just turned to Christ, just converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they really don't know what to do with it. Where do we go from here? Right. Well, a lot of your Jewish converts, what their answer would be, well, obviously you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, you accept Him as Messiah, you obey the gospel, but then you turn to the law. And you have to live out the law. You have to live according to the mandates of the law. And they're still very much steeped in the law. And the law to them is something that they still must embrace and still must live up to. Yeah. So, part of the message they're preaching, listen carefully now, isn't legalism, it's the law. There's the difference. Right. Uh -huh. Legalism is when you just make up rules, arbitrary rules. Yeah. Okay, They're not talking arbitrary rules. They're talking Moses rules. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Do you follow what I'm saying? They're talking specifically about the law of Moses. They're talking specifically about feast days. They're talking specifically about high holy holidays. Uh -huh. You follow what I mean? Yeah. So, they are trying to convince now a lot of the Roman converts that, listen, God gave us the law. God gave us Messiah. Once you accept Messiah and you respond to the gospel, now you've got to embrace the law. And a lot of this, in many instances, what was the first thing that a man who would embrace the law would have to do? Circumcision. Have to be circumcised. So no matter how old you were, if you're 50 years old and you're uncircumcised, well, baby, get out the knife. We're going to have us a, you know, we're going to have us a little party and we're going to circumcise this man. Okay? So Paul is saying to them, okay, you guys are... Considering yourselves evangelists of the law, you're trying to help the Romans see that they need to embrace the law, but at the same time, you're assimilating to their ways so that you're acting as much like them as anybody else is. So how in the world are you going to preach something to them that you're not even living yourself? 
Is Paul talking about living what you ought to be living? No. He's talking about living what in effect and in truth is not even required. But he's talking to them about their hypocrisy. Yeah. Say, so, okay, you guys, you're standing there saying you must embrace the law, you must live up to the law, but you're not even living up to that. You're not even living up to that. You're breaking that. Okay, Paul then goes on to say, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. So Paul is saying to who? The Jews. That among the Gentile world, which would include the Romans, right. the name of God is being blasphemed because of your behavior, your conduct, your hypocrisy. I'm going to tell you something. The church today has brought blasphemy against God out of the mouths of many God-haters and many atheists and uh, agnostics in our world today because of their own hypocrisy and not living up to their own message. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you know, when I was a kid and I used to read about, uh, I preached on it Sunday morning and talked about in the last days there's going to be a persecution. That's something the Lord said was going to happen. When I would read that as a kid, you know, I'd think, yes, hallelujah, glory to God. The church is going to be so righteous. Yes, glory to God, hallelujah, that the world is going to persecute it. No, 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 no. The church has made a jackass of itself. Yeah. I'm just talking plain. Right. The church has made a nuisance of itself. The church has made a hypocrite of itself. It does not live up to its own teaching. On one hand, it talks love. On one hand, it talks grace. On one hand, it talks mercy. And then in the next breath, they go out in the streets and they hold up placards and they hold up signs condemning people and they demonstrate Everything contradictory to what they just got through preaching in the pulpit. Yep. Honey, I got news for you. In the last days, the world is not going to hate the church because the church doesn't deserve it. Oh, Lord. Amen. That's right. Amen. Did you hear me? That's right. See, nowhere in the Lord's teaching did He say why the world was going to persecute the church. That's right. Mm -hmm. He just said persecution was going to come. You follow what I'm telling you? Yep. The reason the persecution is coming, and it is coming, is because the church has lived a hypocritical existence for hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of years. We preach one thing and we live another. Oh, we can get out there, brother, and we can preach how family is the most important thing in the world, and it's the foundation of society, and oh, marriage is the foundation of our society. Half the people in our pews are divorced. Yeah, amen. They're on their second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth marriages. Amen. We're preaching one thing, yep. and we're living another. Right, we're preaching one thing and yet we're doing the same identical things they're doing. Right. We're assimilating to the world in which we live. Oh, hallelujah. I might get happy a little bit tonight. Yes, amen. Instead of demonstrating the love of God, the grace of God, mm -hmm. the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, we are assimilating to the world. One problem I have with affirming ministries, and this is something that I've seen, I've been at this now for 21 years, and this is one reason why this ministry prefers to stand alone. We'll fellowship with anybody, anywhere that wants to try to do right. You don't have to be perfect, but you sure have to have a mind to do right. 
But one of the problems I find is there are preachers in our community who are still living their lives based on the social mores of secular society. There are people in our community who are part of affirming churches and brother, they still follow the rules of the unchurched, secular, LGBT community. There are preachers in pulpits. I know some. I've heard how that some people have gone and talked to them about certain immoral behaviors on the part of LGBT, certain, you know, LGBT Christian people. And the preacher said, well, boys will be boys. That is not a godly answer. You are letting secular society overtake you. You are letting social mores dictate to you what is right and what is wrong. That is what the Jews specifically, specifically, that is what the Jews were doing who were in Rome. They were letting the society around them dictate what they could get away with and what they couldn't get away with. Even though, on one hand, you know, the thing that kills me is there are preachers in our community that preach how that God's perfect plan for relationships is monogamy. Yeah. And that that is the plan of God for any relationship, straight, gay, or otherwise, that a committed, monogamous relationship is uh, the best formula that we have. That that is what God originally designed for human beings. Then they go out and they're no sooner out of the pulpit and they're laying down with every Tom, Dick, and Harry that walks down the street. I know, I know some people, and I'm telling you, you get sick and tired of hearing this junk after a while. I know preachers, every time they go on a conference call somewhere, and they go off to some conference somewhere, they're laying down with somebody while they're at that conference, although they have a partner at home. And yet, brother, you hear them get in the pulpit and they preach monogamy up one side, down the other. How in the world can you be so foolish as to believe that you will not stand before God in the judgment and answer? Yeah. How in the world can you be so foolish as to think for a moment that you will not be called into account? Yeah. Like I said last week, it's very simple what the Holy Ghost spoke to me. They don't believe. That's right. So now these are preachers who are preaching for a paycheck. These are preachers who are preaching for popularity. These are preachers who are preaching to become a celebrity of sorts. Right. I'm going to tell you, not everybody gets up in church and sings is singing for Jesus. That's right. That's right. Amen. A lot of people get up in church and sing, and they're, they're singing because they enjoy the applause when they're done singing. That's right. See, I grew up in Pentecost. I'm going to tell you. I, I mean, honestly, I'm old school, I'm super old school, and a lot of people in our community probably see me as a spiritual dinosaur of sorts. I'd rather hear old Sister Schmelzer get up there at 84 years old and squeak and squawk out, I bowed on my knees and cried holy, than listen to a Whitney Houston or a Jennifer Hudson, get up in the church and let loose with a gorgeous, perfectly timed, perfectly tuned rendition of His Eyes on the Sparrow. Yeah. I'd rather hear somebody sing who means what they're singing and sings what they mean yes. uh -huh. than somebody who's trying to demonstrate Amen. their skills and their talents. And there's no motivation in them whatsoever to bring him the glory. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget years ago. Uh, 
What was her name now? Doggone it, can't think of her name. Father size. Oh, Amy Grant. Amy Grant. Okay. Yes. My cousin Janelle and I, you know, this is back in the early 80s when I first came to Texas. I came to Texas in 1982. February 1982. Oh, we'd be in the car listening to Christian radio and Amy Grant be singing and Janelle just loved Amy Grant. She used to like to sing a lot of her songs. You know, he, she had the father's eyes and all that. And I said to Janelle, I give it maybe two or three or four years, I said, she'll go secular. Uh -huh. Janelle said, well, how would you know that? I said, I'll tell you how. Because she's not singing for the glory of God. Uh -huh. I could feel it in my spirit. I could yes. feel it. Amen. She's talented. She's got a gift. And if she can make money and make a living off of that gift and off that talent, she'll do it in a heartbeat. I said, you let some secular producer come to her and say, hey, you know, you could do well if you'd sing secular. Say that she'll do it in a flat second. I'm going to say this tonight and I'm going to tick off a lot of people. And I'm going to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. This is just the way of the black church. Huh? It's just the way of the black church. You start singing in church and that all that is is a stepping stone and hopefully you can go from there to secular. That's just, that's, it's part of black culture in America. Most people you hear in the black community talk about, you know, singers who are very popular and successful. Oh, well, I started out singing at church. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. There is no higher calling that you could ever have in your entire life than singing God's praises and singing faith and inspiration for the people of God and to right, to His glory, which will not result in you getting any big paychecks, which will not result in your getting any big contracts. Uh-huh. Which will not result in your owning a big house and driving a Rolls Royce or a Bentley. Mm -hmm. Why in the world do people think, brother, that a preacher can go into a community, as I've done on many, many occasions over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. struggle like a lunatic to establish a church make sacrifices that most people can't even fathom. I've lived in the, literally lived, you know that room we got in the back of our sanctuary here? I lived in a room that was no bigger than that at the back of a storefront in my first church just so that I could be a full-time pastor to the people because they asked me if I'd be their full-time pastor. The only way I could keep expenses down enough so we could have a place to worship and have a church was for me to live in the back of that storefront. I've lived in the basement of church buildings that we were renting. I've lived in office buildings that didn't have a shower and had to drive seven or eight miles to a family member's house if I needed to shower. And on Sunday mornings, I'd go to our radio program, and then I'd have to drive to my grandmother's house and take a shower and put on my suit because I didn't have a shower where I was living. Preachers make enormous and oftentimes sacrifices that last for decades in order to build the kingdom of God. And then some little twit who calls him or herself a singing ministry, mm -hmm. comes along and says, I won't sing in no church unless they can guarantee me a thousand dollars. I won't sing in no church unless they'll put me up in a hotel and they've got to pay for my meals and they've got to pay for my transportation. Listen, do not dare put the word ministry uh -huh. Teach it. 
Amen. Don't Amen. you dare put the word ministry behind the word singing because you are not a singing ministry, darling. That's right. You are a songstress for hire. Let's call it what it is. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. Funny, I don't. I, all the years I've been starting churches, I've never once, Brother Jack, been able to walk into a town and say, "I'll come here and start a church, long as you people will pay me five hundred dollars a week." Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But we've got these dingalings call themselves singing ministries. Baloney! You're mm -hmm. full of garbage. Amen. If you are a ministry then you would live by faith the same way any preacher of the gospel has right. to live by faith. Amen. Right. Amen. I get tired of that foolishness. Mm -hmm. And in today's world, it's so prevalent because we've made a business out of gospel music. That's right. I'm going to tell you something. I love Bill Gaither as much as anybody loves Bill Gaither. I love the Happy Goodman as much as anybody loves the Happy Goodman. I love the cathedrals. I love the king. I love Johnny Cook. I love a lot of these folks. They have great talent. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe with every ounce of my being, mm -hmm. there are going to be some shock looks yep. on some singers' faces yeah. when they stand before the Lord in the judgment. And the Lord says, where do you think you had the authority or the authorization mm -hmm. to take money from my people yes, amen. to encourage them and inspire them with song or to right. usher them into a place of worship through music. Where do you think amen. you get the authorization to do that? My Bible tells me there's a five-fold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I don't see musicians. I don't see singers. I don't see uh, song leaders or worship leaders. There are churches out there, brother, that pay their song leader as much as they pay their pastor. That pay their worship leader as much as they pay their pastor. Because it's a business. It's like a nightclub bringing in a DJ who's well known, who does their job well and builds their audience, you know. More people will come to the nightclub and dance if we have DJ Schmo Schmo here. <laughs> yeah, amen. Yo, what's up, what's up, what's up? Zing, 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 zing. It's the same garbage, different color. The church has become a business. Amen. Amen. And it's all about creating the best product that will draw the most people. And the motivation on most people's part doesn't have jack squat to do with building the kingdom of God. Because I'm going to tell you something. When your motivation is to build the kingdom of God, you're not interested in filling a building with people and then being afraid to tell them what they've got to do to make heaven. That's right. Amen. If your motivation is to build the kingdom of God, I've been in this ministry, I've been in this city 12 years. And I'm going to tell you something. I have not one time shirked from my responsibility to say what needed to be said, right. even Amen. if people wound up walking out the door never coming back. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I know my priorities. I know my job. If I'm supposed to sound a warning in your hearing, then I'm going to sound that warning in your hearing. Lord. And if you're going to walk out the door because you get ticked off at the preacher and you don't like what he had to say, so be it. I will stand before God in the judgment blameless. I'm not going to have your blood on my hands. Amen. Amen. We got people tonight in spiritual ruin, honey. Spiritually, they're laying out in the middle of the road flat as a pancake, then bowled over by a bulldozer. Amen. And I'm telling you right now, you know as well as I do, I don't, their blood's not on my hands. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Joshua, you will never look at me, boy, and say you didn't warn me. That's a lie from hell. Amen. Don't you even try that foolishness. Amen. 
Not only did I warn you, I specifically warned you. I told you exactly what the enemy would put in front of you. And that's exactly what he did. And I could name names tonight by the dozens. People I've warned. I told them. Relationships that have gone to pot, and I tried to tell them. Amen. If you'll take your time, if you'll let God work with you, if you'll let the Lord lead you, then your relationship won't wind up going down the toilet. But oh no, brother, they just got mad at the preacher, ran out there, boy, and did what they wanted to do. And now their relationship is, quote, open. Now, all of a sudden, they're letting other people in their beds. I got news for you. Once you get to that point in your relationship, it'll be over before too long. Right. Amen. I guarantee you. That's how it progresses. I've never seen anybody open up their relationship and it became healthier and stronger and better. That's right. Amen. No, that's usually emblemic of trouble. Yeah. All right. I said all that to say this again. Even this mentality about gospel music being a business that is us being affected by the world in which we live. Amen. Folks, there's a word for that that we used to use in the Holiness Church. Wow. It's called worldliness. Amen. What is worldliness? It means a worldly mindset, a worldly way of seeing things, a worldly way of doing things. That's not the way it's seen in the church. That's not the way it's done in the church. It's not the way we look at it in the church. It's the way the world sees it. The world says if you have great talent, you yeah. should make great money. Yes, amen. Uh -huh. I, I did years ago, I did a, uh, a paid a psychologist to have a uh, private IQ test done. And uh, it was hours and hours and hours long. Uh -huh. <sighs> and it was boring as all holy murder. Had to sit there and answer question after question. Yeah. I mean, just <laughs> page after page. Right. Mm -hmm. I got so bored with it after a while, I just started filling in any old circle. It's one of them where you fill in circles, you know. I didn't know till later that the psychologist, as part of the exam, was sitting behind a one-way glass watching me. Uh -huh. I didn't know he was back there. Honestly, I had no idea. Yeah. He said, I saw the exact minute <laughs> when you got so tired and so bored that yeah. you just wasn't going to have it no more, and you just started filling in any answer. <laughs> he said, I saw it happen right in front of my eyes. Yeah. said, you scored a 137, and he said, if you'd have taken the time and had the patience to continue answering the questions, yeah. instead of getting tired and bored with it, and just, you know, mm -hmm. he said, you'd have scored way higher than that boy. Yeah. Yeah. And we're in 137 isn't too bad well, that's pretty good. to start with. He said, you'd have scored way higher than that. He said, well, I'm going to tell you something. you got a mind. You can be anything Amen. in this world. Amen. He said, you literally, there is nothing in the universe keeping you from being a doctor. Amen. There's nothing in the world keeping you from being an attorney. There is nothing right. in the world keeping you from being an astronaut or a scientist. He said, you've got the mind for it. That's right. And I looked at him. I was about 17 at the time. I looked at him and I said, oh, wonderful. I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> and he looked at me, honestly, I'll never forget this guy, I'll never forget him as long as I live. He had a big old bushy head, of a white man with a big old bushy head of curly hair and a beard and mustache type deal and glasses. At the time, he was probably about maybe 30, 35 years old. And he said, what a waste. What a waste. And I looked at him and I said, you know something? It is not a waste. I said, I believe that God is real. That's right. And I believe that he deserves the cream of the crop, the best of the best. That's and right. if that's what you're telling me I am, then in my mind, that's exactly what I need to do, yes. is give it to God. Amen. Amen. Right. Now I'm going to tell you a little yep. secret. I have not made money 
off of these brains of mine. I have not made, you know, my millions. I have not gleaned. Honey, I have scraped and I have sacrificed and I have done without for decade after decade after decade over the last 30 some years of ministry. Yes, amen. I've seen people's lives changed. Right, amen. In a split second. By the power of God. That's right. I've seen people. Who, yes, I've seen amen. people possessed by demons. Delivered. Yes. By the hand of God. And I have seen their life. Literally to a hundred and eighty degrees turn. Right. In one minute's time. Mm -hmm. I've seen people come into the church house. Bound up by devils. Sounding and looking and acting as crazy as anything you've ever seen at Terrell Mental Hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they leave as sober and as sound as a judge. Yes, I've seen people with drug addiction who've been through rehab four times, five times, and but by the grace of God, their lives were spared. Yes, amen. Because how many times they wound up in an emergency room that close to death because of an accidental overdose or something of that kind. And I have seen that person in the altar pray through to a good old-fashioned experience with God that we call the baptism of the yes. Holy Ghost. Yes. And I've seen them get up from that altar. I've seen them become preachers. I've seen them become pastors. Never again the rest of their lives did they ever touch a drug or anything of an addictive nature. Yes, amen. I've seen God break the bondage of sexual addiction. I've seen God break the bondage of tobacco addiction. I've seen God break the bondage of alcohol addiction. Uh -huh. yes, I've seen God heal broken hearts. I've seen the Lord restore broken families. Amen. Oh, sweetheart. The problem is, I'm not looking for the same paycheck you're looking for. Amen. Uh -huh. I'm not looking for the same payoff that you're looking for. Amen. See, those success stories, that's my paycheck. That's right. Those are the things that I make what I do worthwhile. Uh-huh. Amen. That 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 just makes it I'm gonna tell you, every time I see somebody pray through the Holy Ghost, honey, every year of ministry leading up to that minute suddenly feels it was worth it. Amen. Every single minute of it feels like it was worth it. But we got people in the church today who like the Jews living in Rome. Let Rome affect how they do things and how they live. And they become hypocrites to their own cause. And listen to me now. And a detriment to their own message. Uh -huh. yes. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. I'm going to tell you, if you're not turning people on mm -hmm. to the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. I guarantee you... I guarantee you, it, it, the way you live your life as a child of God, it's going to do one of two things. You're either going to turn them on or you're going to turn them off. Amen. Amen. You're not going to leave them neutral. That's right. Don't you think, well, the way I do things, it, it won't affect them one way or the other. Oh, yes, it will. Amen. You're either going to turn people on to the Lord or you're going to turn them off. I guarantee it. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. yes. Your life is either going to be a light or it is going to be a light under a bushel. Mm -hmm. And you will be in as much darkness as anybody around you. Mm -hmm. There yes. is no middle ground. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying to the Jews, he said, now y'all are bringing the law to these people. You're presenting the law as though it is part of the Christian experience and it's part of what we as believers are supposed to embrace, he said, and yet you're making such fools out of yourselves through your hypocrisy and your inconsistency that the name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles. Yeah. Said all the non-Jews 
everywhere are poking fun at our God. They're speaking evil of our God because of the way you behave and the way you conduct yourself. My Lord, have mercy. I'm going to tell you, is there a message in the church for that today? You had better believe it. You had better believe it. I see the way the church has been acting over the last, I've been in this world for 48 years. And I see the way the church conducts itself. And, and I, I see people growing so vehemently disgusted with Christianity. And the sad part of it is, these poor morons who are bringing this blasphemy against our God can't even see that it's the byproduct of their stupidity and their hypocrisy that these things are being brought. They don't even see it, brother. They're so caught up in their foolishness. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of friends on Facebook and what have you. I say from the old days in my life, from a time in my life when I was raised in the fundamentalist Pentecostal movement. And it, it just amazes me sometimes to see some of the comments they post and the things they say. Brother, I sit there and say to myself, how in the world, how in the world can you possibly be so stupid? I'm sorry to say it that way tonight. I really am. How can you be so stupid as to say that and think for even one split second? It's a Christian thing to say. Or it's a Christian attitude to have. Or it's a Christian perspective to view things from. You follow what I'm saying? I don't understand it. I don't get it. I'm sitting there. But you see, when you're in that mess, you're so blinded by your own hypocrisy. And yet these same people are screaming and hollering, America needs to repent. No, honey, you need to repent. Amen. Right. You need to get your mind out of the politics. Amen. You need to get your mind out of the culture war. Amen. Uh -huh. The church shouldn't be at war with anybody anywhere. Amen. Right. The Word of God said, for uh, uh, the, the enemy of the church is not flesh and blood. Amen. 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 Do not. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. A picket line is carnal. That's Amen. right. A placard is carnal. Amen. Uh -huh. A megaphone is carnal. Uh -huh. That's right. You go to a gay pride parade and you hold up your signs and hold up your placards telling people that God judges them and God condemns them. Sweetheart, your tactics are carnal. Those people in that parade, whether you like the way they live their life or not, are not your enemy. That's right. right. Amen. Amen. My word, have mercy. Did you hear me? They're not Amen. even your enemy. The Word of God said to pray for your enemies. Uh -huh. yes. They're not Amen. even your enemy. Right. You ought to be praying for them. They're not even your enemy. Yeah. You don't even know who your enemy is. That's right. I preached a message years ago in this church. Identifying the enemy. Because I'm going to tell you a little secret. As long as Satan can have you looking in the wrong direction. That's right. Yep. Amen. Hope you hear me. As long Amen. as the enemy can have you looking in the wrong direction, he can devour you from the backside. Amen. Right. Amen. And the church 
is being eaten alive. That's right. Uh -huh. Because it's so busy looking at gay, lesbian people and calling them the enemy. Uh -huh. They're so busy looking at the abortionists and calling them the enemy. Right. They don't even see that Satan is destroying the church from the other side. That's right. Amen. There are so many issues affecting the church and like a cancer, just eating it alive. There are so many issues destroying the church from other directions. They can't even see it! That's right. Because they're so busy looking over here! Yep. Mm -hmm. I found something interesting last night. I told you, I get inspiration. You know, the Holy Ghost will talk to me sometimes just over the craziest things. <laughs> I'm sitting on the bed and I'm working on my laptop and I have the wireless uh, mouse, you know, and I have the TV remote sitting there. And all of a sudden I hear something drop off of the little uh, TV tray, you know, that I keep next to the bed that I use my mouse on or what have you. And when I get up to go to the restaurant, I put my laptop on that little TV tray, you know. And I hear something fall off it, and I look, and I said, oh, I, I think I dropped the remote. So I get down on my hands and knees, and bless God, I'm looking for that remote. <laughs> I cannot find that remote anywhere. Now, how in the world the remote could fall off the TV tray? How far can it go? How far can it go? So finally I get up, and I'm looking at the <laughs> tray, and there sits the remote. And I said, oh, I guess it wasn't the remote I dropped after all. It must have been something else. Yeah. So now I'm looking at the tray and I'm saying, well, what else was on there that is not on there at the moment? Uh -huh. Well, the mouse, the wireless mouse. I said, okay, it's the mouse I must have dropped. So I get down on my hands and knees and by God, there sits the mouse uh -huh. right in front of me. I did not see the mouse while I was looking for the remote. Son of a gun. Woo! Yes, amen. Mm. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Yes, amen. I could, oh, I'm, oh. <laughs> yes, amen. I'm telling you, I could not see the mouse while I was looking for the remote. I didn't see the mouse and say, oh, well, it must have been the mouse that fell. No, yeah. I'm too busy focusing on finding the remote. Yep. The mouse is sitting right there in front of me. I know it don't belong on the floor. <laughs> but, you don't see it. but I didn't even see it. That's right. I'm going to tell you, you know why the enemy likes to get people involved in cults? You know why the enemy likes to get you looking in this direction or that direction? Because, honey, as long as he can get you focused on the wrong thing, you'll never find the right thing. Right. You're not looking for the right thing. As long as he can keep you focused on looking for one thing, then, honey, that's all you're going to see. That's right. Amen. My word have mercy. People say, well, you know, these folks are so religious, you think they'd really be hungering and thirsting yeah. for truth. Yeah. And if they were really hungering and thirsting for truth, then doesn't it seem like God would show it to them? Yes. No, because truth mm -hmm. is not what they're looking for. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. They're looking for answers. Uh -huh. Right. Their answers, so. Yep. How many times I've heard people say, well, you know, I started letting these Jehovah's Witnesses come into my house and do a Bible study with me, and everything I asked them, they seem to have answers. Right. Yep. Sure, they had answers. Was it the truth? Right. That's no. Right. But see, you weren't looking for the truth. That's right. My Lord had mercy. You couldn't see the mouse. You're too busy looking for the remote. That's right. Honey, I'm going to tell you something. If all you're looking for is something that sounds like it makes sense, uh -huh. oh, my Lord have mercy, then you will be satisfied with something that sounds like it makes sense. That's right. 
That is how Satan is able to deceive the nations. Because he knows people will only find what they're looking for. Oh, my word have mercy. Word of God said Eve, ooh, I'll tell you. <laughs> Word of God said Eve looked upon the fruit of the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. And she what? She saw that it was good to look upon for meat. It looked like it tastes good. It looked like it'd be tasty. It looked like it would be appealing. What was she looking for? She shouldn't even have been looking at the fruit on that tree with the thought in mind, I wonder how it would taste. That's right. Because God said, that's the one tree you don't eat from. Uh -huh. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, I can look. I've told you all this before. I, sometimes I get such a chuckle. I, I, every once in a while I'll do this. Now, somebody out there is going to condemn me for this. Somebody out there is going to find a way to say something evil of me. So be it. I'm, I told you, I'm transparent, I'm honest. Yeah. Every once in a while, you know, <clears throat> on Facebook or something, somebody will post a picture of, you know, like models. Mm -hmm. And boy, just real pretty people, you know. Yeah. And I'll click on the picture, and then of course you can just keep clicking and you go through a series of them. Yeah. Well, sometimes, boy, they'll have this really handsome fella dressed in this really nice outfit. You know, maybe it's a runway show or something, and I'll click on the picture and say, boy, he's a nice looking fellow. Of course, the suit looks like it come from outer space. <laughs> and then I'll start clicking through the pictures and thinking, all oh, these beautiful people, supposedly, you know. One after another, after another, after another. Brother, I can look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They can be in virtually any attire or lack thereof. And you know what? I don't lust after a one of them. Because I'm not looking to lust. It's not my purpose in looking. Our Lord have mercy. Are you hearing me now? That's why Jesus said, If a man looketh upon a woman to lust after her. That's right. Didn't say you dingle. That if you look at a woman in lust, because that happens. Mm -hmm. That's just part of being human. Yeah. You can look at somebody and say, oh my, they really grab your goat and, you know, inspire you. <laughs> get your blood pressure up a little bit. The Lord didn't say that. He was talking about the intent That's with right. which you look. That's right. Why are you looking at her? Uh -huh. To lust. Well, there are specific situations where that's exactly what you're doing. When you look at pornography, that's right. because you want to have a little one-on-one -on -one party, then, honey, you are looking with the intent to lust. Mm -hmm. You can call it anything you want to call it. That's right. You are looking at that person with the intent to lust. All right. So, I need to get myself back on track. I got off my teaching and into a little preaching. <laughs> so, the church does glean a lesson from what Paul is saying here. It's not merely about, Paul is not merely saying here, you can't preach one thing and do another. That's not what Paul is saying. He's talking to the Jews at Rome, saying to them, here you are trying to introduce the law to these people, but you're not even living up to that very same law. Okay? Is there a lesson again? Yeah! Yeah! But it's not a direct lesson, it's a secondary lesson. Mm -hmm. It's not what Paul is saying directly, mm -hmm. but can you glean from what Paul is saying that being hypocritical about what you teach and preach is detrimental to your message? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? All right. He then goes on to say, <clears throat> For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. Now, 
Oh, could I really go some places with this and make some apostolic people mad at me? What is the New Testament circumcision? Baptism in Jesus' name. Oh. Baptism in Jesus' name is the New Testament circumcision. Okay? That's the physical act by which we seal our covenant. That's right. That's how we secure the New Testament, the New Covenant. All right? Paul talks here to these Jews and he says to them, Now they're trying to convince the Romans they need to be circumcised. Paul said, Listen. Circumcision doesn't profit anybody unless they're trying to embrace and live up to the whole of the law to begin with. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're circumcised and you're not trying to live up to the whole of the law, yeah. then your circumcision is worthless. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. So it's without value. He said by the same token... If you're trying to live right and do right, but you have not been circumcised, then does not God, don't you think God would look upon you and say, in his heart he's circumcised. In their heart they're circumcised. This is one reason why I say, and I told you I'm going to make a lot of apostolic people mad. This is why I say, I'm not going to sit in judgment and say who made heaven and who did not. That's right. Because I've got news for you. Man looks on the outward. God looks on the heart. God knows how many Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal people that may not have been baptized in Jesus' name have a circumcised heart. Yes, amen. My Lord have mercy. Because I've got news for you. There are some people out there who are uncircumcised mm -hmm. by New Testament apostolic standards who are doing more to live the law. Who are doing more to live the righteous path and to walk before God the way they ought to walk before the Lord than a lot of these apostolic folks who've been baptized in Jesus' name, who've been uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, who go to church every Sunday. And yet, they go out there and break every law that God's established in the New Testament church. They're hateful, they're mean-spirited, they're malicious. Sweetheart, i got news for you. That is not the way we're taught to conduct ourselves right. in the New Testament church. So I can't make that call, and I'm not going to make that call. I could go into the story Jesus shares about men being called into the field to work at various times of the day. They don't all, they don't all do the same work. They don't all get the same amount to accomplish, but they all get the same pay. Right. Amen. Yep. It's God's call to make. That's right. Now, does that change what I preach as the full apostolic Bible standard for salvation? Not for a million years. Because what you know to do, you must do. Right. Amen. We have the light. We have the full message. We have the full gospel. We have a full understanding. We have a full revelation. Again, we go back to Romans. Paul talks about those that have a full understanding and have a full revelation. And yet they turn around and act like they don't. And how dangerous that is. Alright? So Paul now, he's talking about <clears throat> the value of circumcision, but he's talking about it in terms of spiritual circumcision. And he says, all you're worried about is the, the, the act. The literal, physical act. He said, but there is the circumcision of the heart. When somebody's trying to do right, they may not get everything done. They need to get done. Am I telling the truth? No. See, now let's go on here. He said, uh, And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfilled the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law. For he is not a Jew. I love this. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which
which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. What is Paul saying here in a nutshell as we try to close up chapter 2 tonight? Folks, it all boils down to the condition of your heart. Yes. Amen. This is good news. Yes, is. This is good news. This is good news for LGBT people. This is good news for a lot of people tonight. Folks, we get so caught up in the letter of the law. We do the same thing in the New Testament church. There are not anywhere near the level of, quote, requirements in the New Testament that God had for the people of Israel in the Old Testament. That's right. But we can get so caught up in the letter of the law. Hey, it doesn't matter if there's five rules versus 5,000. We can still get, this is why, again, I say, there are a lot of people in the oneness movement who look at somebody who, who may have her hair piled on her head just as high as you do, may have her dresses to the floor just as long as you do. But she goes First Trinitarian Pentecostal Church, and I go to First Oneness Pentecostal Church. She ain't got nothing. Yeah. Sure, she got the Holy Ghost talks in tongues. She hasn't been baptized in Jesus' name. And she never will if you act like a fool around her. That's, That's right. right. Amen. That's right. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I know a lady from Riverside Church of God. One of the most diehard Church of God ladies I've ever known in my life. When Brother Gillum retired and he left Riverside and they tried to bring in pastor after pastor and none of them could fill his shoes and could carry the church the way that he had for all those years. She wound up in an apostolic church. I'm going to tell you, she walked into that church looking apostolic before she ever got in there, honey. She'd been living that for the last 50 years mm -hmm. in the church of God. You don't know when God is going to get somebody to finally come the whole way in. Yeah, that's right. You don't know when the Lord... But I'm going to tell you, if you stand there and look at people like they are lost and have nothing with God and they don't have nothing because they hadn't adhered to this, this, this... Listen, you can have every conviction as I do yes. in Jesus' name baptism. Amen. The only way I know for sure to make sure beyond the shadow of a doubt that your account is settled is to do it God's way. Amen. That's right. Amen. Any other way, as far as I'm concerned, if, if, you, if you're going to try to shave this or shave that and see if you can get away with it, just the fact you're trying to see if you can get away with it, you're gambling. That's Amen. right. And I've got a feeling, according to Scripture, he that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. That's i got right. a feeling you're going to lose that bet. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh-huh. Okay. But now somebody who genuinely, sincerely never comes to an understanding, never sees it, never, you know, never, that, that for, listen, there are people, folks, who intellectually are challenged, let's put it that way, they may never understand it, they may never see it, it may never hit them. Paul says circumcision, this is a physical act that the Jews saw it as absolutely what? Essential. Mm -hmm. You had to do this. And yet Paul was saying, no you don't. Yeah, that's right. No you don't. So I'll tell you why. Because what you're seeing in the physical act, mm -hmm. you can do this in the physical and yet spiritually remain depraved. That's right. Hello now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people go down the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, and spiritually they come up yet uncircumcised. Uh-huh. You hear what I'm telling you? Yep. And Paul is saying, let me tell you, the concept that man looks on the outward but God looks on the heart, this is a factual concept, folks. The condition and state of your heart is so important. I've talked about this, I'm going to try to close it up. I've talked about this with the woman at the well talking with Jesus. 
marriage was not at that time in history what it is today, not by a million miles. When the Lord looked at that woman and said, go get your husband. And she said, Lord, I don't have a husband. And he looked at her and said, boy, you said that well. I like the way you said that. You sure don't have a husband. The man you're living with now, you're really not married to. Folks, according to Jewish law, if she were living with a man and was not perceived as being married to him, they'd be stoned. They'd be fornicators. Every outward evidence would suggest that they were married. When the Lord said to that woman what he said to her, and all of a sudden she realized, Dear God, I think I've got the Messiah sitting in front of me. Amen. The reason she came to this revelation and this understanding is not because the Lord knew her situation. Went far deeper than that. Oh, God have mercy. Yes, amen. Ooh. He knew the thought and intent of her heart. That's right. Oh, hallelujah. He said, yeah, you're living with a man like you're married. Everybody in town thinks you're married. Yeah. But you just honestly told me He's not my husband. I'm really not committed to him. I'm really not in this thing like a wife is supposed to be in this thing. Are you following me now? And the Lord turned and said, Boy, you said that well. You've had five husbands, but the man you with now, that ain't your husband. Are you following? The Lord was showing her. He understood what was going on in her heart and in her head. Shocked her right out of her mind. But somehow, some way, in talking to this man, Jesus, she just could not find it in her heart to even for a moment try to be deceitful. My Lord had mercy. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you talk to Jesus, and he just has a way of bringing the truth out. Yes, amen. He has a way of just making you want to be honest. Look at old David, amen. David my sin have I not hid from thee, said, Lord. Uh, there's just something about you. I just can't even try to hide my faults. I just can't even try to hide my sins. I can't even hide my weaknesses. I just have to be honest with you. I just have to be truthful with you. Oh, hallelujah. I want to tell you tonight, the second chapter of the book of Romans, in, as Paul is speaking to the Jewish believers in Rome and he talks to them of their their still reliance upon the law and yet their hypocrisy at the same time because they're preaching one thing but they're not living another are there lessons to be learned and gleaned from what Paul is saying yes are they direct lessons no because he's not talking to us are you following what I'm saying tonight it's important to keep things in context and understand. Does that mean everything he's saying holds no value for us? No, there's value. Absolutely there's value. But just understand, he's talking to these people about this circumstance and this situation. How does that then parallel with the church? How does that then apply to the believer who is not a Jew? Live what you preach. Preach what you live. Don't let the world dictate how you think, what you do, and how you conduct yourself. Hello now. But more importantly than this, understand that when it's all said and done, I won't paraphrase, he is not a Christian who is one outwardly. That's right. <laughs> Hallelujah! But one inwardly. And their circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. You get a bunch of, quote, homeless people together who all live in the letter of the law. They'll sit there and pat each other on the butt all day and all night long. 
How wonderful brother so-and-so is. How glorious sister so-and-so is. Because after all, they look the part to the T. They can be the most wicked, devilish person ever walked the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. But you'll just hear the lookalikes patting each other on the back because after all, the only thing they're impressed by is what they can see. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, whose praise is not of men. Because I've said it before and I'll say it in closing tonight. When you have a law that you're trying to live up to, it does more to satisfy you than it does God. Yes, it does more to help you fit into a pack than it does to help you make it into heaven. Yeah. It does more to earn you the praise of men than it does to bring you the praise of God. Amen. Yes. We made it through chapter 2. Would you stand with me tonight? Praise God.